This video is being sponsored by BSGO. Here are the cameras that I've shot with this year. The ZV-1F, the ZV-1, the ZV-E10, the Fuji X-H2, the Sony FX30, the Sigma FP, the Sony a7 III, the a7 IV, and the a7S III. And I've become comfortable with them enough to tell you my experience with them. I'm gonna free flow with you and tell you what I used each camera for so you have a better idea of which one is right for you. But I'm gonna save my favorite for the end of the video. But here's a hint, it's not the most expensive one. And that's what we're gonna to cover today on the Film Alliance. So to start off, every single one of these cameras has its use. To help you figure out which one is right for you, I'm gonna give you scenario-based situations where I may pull out one of these cameras out of my camera bag. So we're gonna start off with the Sony ZV-1F. I rented that camera for about five days, about a month ago, and I was able to go out and shoot a lot of cinematic type shots along with a lot of low light shots. I was able to directly compare the footage I was getting with the ZV-1F to the ZV-1. I made sure that the exposure was completely the same and my lighting conditions stayed the same throughout that competitive shoot. I do like how the ZV-1F is a lot cheaper than the ZV-1 and the image quality is definitely comparable. I did make a review video for the ZV-1F where I compared it to the ZV-1. I will leave that in the description. What I didn't really like about it was the functionality, how it was missing the little autofocus manual focus display marker on the screen. Also, when I was shooting in low light, I was trying to shoot an S-Log3 and it didn't work out very well. All of my shadows had too much noise in it for me to actually be able to use that footage. So although this isn't my favorite camera, I would pull it out of my bag if I was doing maybe behind the scenes shots. I also think it would make a great vlog camera. Although I would recommend picking up a gimbal for it because the active stabilization within the camera isn't that good. All right, now let's move on to the ZV-1. As you probably know, I've had the ZV-1 for over two and a half years and I've shot many different videos with it, many YouTube videos, client work, behind the scenes, and I've taken it in all different types of terrain. I love how small it is, how compact it is, and also the image quality that you get out of it. I also like how it has a built-in ND filter and the HFR mode, which I don't take advantage of enough. You can get super slow motion videos and as long as you light your subject properly, you'll be getting some really nice slow motion videos. I don't like how fast the battery runs out and the active stabilization, just like the ZV-1F, is not that good. So I would recommend picking up a gimbal if you wanted to do any type of vlog shooting or cinematic type B-roll. I would pull the ZV-1 out of my VSGO camera bag for behind the scenes shooting, in between takes, vlogging, or maybe trying to fill in some of the gaps with some B-roll that I picked up with the ZV-1. I did make a custom profile that closely matches s Cinetone out of the full frame A7S III, FX30, and FX3, and I will leave that link in the description in case you have a full frame camera and you want your colors to match up between your ZV-1 and your Sony cameras that offer s Cinetone. All right, now for the ZV-E10. I've had the ZV-E10 for over a year now, and it's definitely a step up from the ZV-1. I think the fact that you can interchange lenses and also the sensor is bigger than the ZV-1 and the ZV-1F, so you're gonna get a better dynamic range out of your picture. I've used the ZV-E10 as an A cam in some client work. I've used it as a B cam. I've done behind the scenes shooting, some vlogging with it, use it in a controlled lighting environment like this, a not so controlled lighting environment, and I've done YouTube videos with it. But in order to unlock the power of the ZV-E10, I would recommend picking up some more glass other than the kit lens that it comes with. I have had a great experience with the ZV-E10 and I really feel like it's the camera that took me to the next level. Right now, the Viltrox 13mm f1.4 lives on the ZV-E10 and I use that pretty much for all of my shooting. What I don't like about the ZV-E10 is the battery life and because of the fact that it doesn't have a dual SD card slot on the side, it only has a slot for one SD. So if one of my video files becomes corrupt, I don't have a backup. I did make a one year video about the ZV-E10 and I'll leave that in the description in case you're interested in diving a little bit deeper into the ZV-E10. All right, now let's pause for our sponsored mention. Okay. No matter what camera you're shooting with, you're gonna need a way to be able to transport your cameras from one location to the next, and you wanna do that safely. And that brings us to today's sponsor, which is VSGO. They have created a commuting camera backpack that can fit one mirrorless camera body with four to five lenses and accessories, or a DSLR camera body plus two or three lenses, some accessories, and a drone. The techwear style backpack can meet a variety of purposes. It can be used for daily commuting or outdoor photography or for traveling. 
Some of its key features are its signature filed lock, which has a magnetic design for quick opening, protection with anti-shock, anti-dust, and an anti-theft buckle, stability, the backpack can stand up firmly, and the divided storage can meet different travel needs. And it's super comfortable with its suspension system and the breathability because it eliminates pressure. They also sent me a travel camera cleaning kit, a sensor cleaner, and their air blower, which hooks up to the front buckle of the backpack which is pretty cool. As my gear bank grows and your gear bank grows, we're gonna need a way to transport that from one place to the next safely. And I put 100% confidence into this backpack because it's so well made. I'll leave a link in the description for any of you who are interested in picking up a new camera bag. All right, now back to our video. The next camera we're gonna cover is the Fuji X-H2. I rented this camera for about five days because I wanted to directly compare it to the FX30. Believe it or not, I haven't been able to put that video out yet because I've been so busy with everything else. But every single day that I had it, I shot with it. And I gotta tell you, it is an amazing camera. It's so much different than Sony cameras. The look is different. It has almost a cinematic feel to it. I can't really explain it. But I shot with it in all different conditions. Low light, controlled light, not so controlled light, outside, inside, golden hour in the morning, and some landscape shots. And I did a little bit of photography with it. I really love the images and the video that I was getting with that camera and the fact that it can shoot in 8K. I did quite a bit of 8K filming and when I got home, my computer couldn't even handle it so I had to make some proxies. But after I exported, I was really shocked at how it really did maintain that 8K resolution. I also liked the simple interface and how easy that was to use. It was a lot easier getting to know the Fuji because I only had it for five days than it would have been if I had to learn how to use the FX30 in that amount of time. But I feel like within about an hour, I was able to put it all together, go out and start shooting with it right away. One thing that I didn't like about it is it seemed to be a little bit finicky. Sometimes you would press the record button and it didn't work and you press it again and it didn't work. And then I realized that the lens wasn't 100% connected to the camera body, which I have no idea why that was. And there were a couple other things that I just felt like maybe there were some bugs and it just needed a firmware update. Other than that, I really did enjoy using it. A scenario where I would pull out that camera would be to shoot a documentary. The camera is super small, but it puts out a great image and it's super easy to use. I can see why Fuji has such a big fan base because after I sent it back, I really contemplated picking one up and returning the FX30. And now onto the Sony FX30. I've owned this camera for about two months and I've done a crazy amount of shooting with it in the time that I've had it. I've shot it on client work, a ton of YouTube videos, low light. I did a short film with it and I've tried all different types of lenses. So I'm pretty confident and competent when it comes to the FX30. The thing I love about it the most is you can shoot in 4K 120 and 4K 60 and the color profiles that you get in the FX30 are going to be the same as the A7S III, which is my main A cam. Even though the sensor is amazing, I don't like that it's an APS-C sensor because I don't get that same dynamic range as I do from a full frame. And also low light shooting is not gonna be as good as when I'm shooting with the A7S III. But I do love the fact that you can use APS-C lenses because they're so much cheaper than full frame lenses. I've already made a ton of videos about the FX30 and I'll link some of those videos in the description if you wanna go deeper into the FX30. All right, now onto the Sigma FP. Sigma actually sent me out the FP for about two weeks and I was able to shoot with it a lot during that time. I actually versed it against the A7S III, the ZV-1, and the ZV-E10. So I could get a good baseline of what that picture looks like compared to those other cameras. One thing that was shocking to me is that you can actually shoot raw internally with the Sigma. I had to hook up an external SSD just to be able to capture all of that data and then editing it on Final Cut Pro was not very fun, but I was getting some incredible looking movie-like shots. Now Sigma also has a fan base, and if you overexpose the Sigma FP and make a video about it, they will definitely let you know, because I got many comments that some of my shots were overexposed. So I'd like to formally make an apology to all of you Sigma fans for overexposing the Sigma FP. To me, it looked good when I was out there filming, and I guess when I was editing the RAW, I didn't bring the highlights down enough. So sorry about that. I'd say out of all these cameras so far, other than being able to shoot raw, I really liked the interface on the Sigma FP as well. It was probably the easiest interface that I've ever used for any camera. Everything was just 
right there for you. It wasn't confusing at all, especially when you compare that to the Sony menu system, both the old one and the new one. And I'm very used to using both of those, but I still find myself sometimes spending a lot of time digging, looking for something. One thing I didn't like about the Sigma FP is I had to hook up external storage to it, which I don't think is the Sigma's fault. It's just the fact that it puts out such a raw image that it takes up a lot of data. But that made it difficult when it came to hooking it up to a gimbal or even shooting handheld. I had a cable kind of flopping around. I know there's accessories out there. And I've also heard a lot of people say that you can use Slim Raw when you're editing to really minimize that amount of data. And the reason why I didn't like shooting in RAW is because if I decided to go out and shoot a two minute video, then I would actually have to invest in storage just to shoot that video. But I'm not gonna hold that against the Sigma FP because that's just what happens when you're shooting RAW. I would pull the Sigma FP out of my VSGO camera bag when it came time to shoot an actual movie. You would get some incredible dynamic range in all different types of lighting conditions. All right, now for the Sony a7 III. The a7 III was my first real camera. I had it for about two years before I picked up the a7S III and I've shot everything with the a7 III. What I love about it is that it's a full frame camera so it does really well in low light situations, although you can only shoot up to 4K 24. So that would be something that I don't like about it. I always wanted to be able to shoot in 4K 60 to have the best resolution that I could in case I needed to punch in. Most of the time, if I wanted to shoot in slow motion, then I would have to bring it down to 1080. The scenario where I would pull the a7 III out of my VSGO camera bag would be when I'm stepping up from the ZV-E10 to go to full frame. Maybe I can't afford an a7S III. Well, the a7 III is the perfect A cam for your ZV-E10 B cam. Or if you already have an a7S III and you're looking for a B cam, and you don't want to use the ZV-E10 because it's an APS-C sensor, then I would pick up an a7 III to be my B-cam. Now on to the Sony a7 IV. I had the a7 IV for about five days, which I also rented from Lens Rentals. I shot extensively with it, and it really reminded me of the a7S III. Everything about it pretty much from the image quality to the menu system to the button setup, it just felt like I was shooting with the a7S III. Now it doesn't have all the functionality the a7S III has, but it does have enough to become my ACAM if I needed it. I really like that you can shoot in 4K 60 with the a7 IV, but I wasn't too keen that it punches in, I think 1.5 times. So that's something I didn't like about it. Sometimes you wanna to continue to hold that frame, you set everything up and then you switch it over to 60 frames per second and then it punches in. So that was something I didn't really like, but there is another thing that I really liked and that's being able to use my APS-C lenses with the a7 IV. Over the years, I've picked up tons of APS-C lenses, which would go to waste if I only shot with full frame. So being able to turn the a7 IV to super 35 mode and be able to use my APS-C lenses is really a game changer. In fact, it might be my favorite camera, but don't hold your breath. The a7S III is probably the camera that I've used close to the most. Second runner up would probably be the ZV-1 and then third is the ZV-E10. I love that you can shoot in 4K 60 and 4K 120 with it. I love the image quality that you get out of the a7S III. I love the dynamic range that it has, especially when you compare it to those other cameras like the ZV-E10 or ZV-1. There's just so much more dynamic range. And one thing I don't like about it is I think Sony separated their hybrid line with their cinema line. So all of the updates that come with the FX3 and FX30, the A7S3 doesn't get them. And that includes time code and Cine EI. So it does make me wish I could go back in time and pick up the FX3 to be the A cam to my FX30. But it doesn't really matter because it's pretty much the same exact camera as the FX3. The scenario that I would use to pull the a7S III out of my camera bag would be pretty much for anything. YouTube videos, headshots, client work, B-roll. I mean, that's what I use it for anyways. Just throw it on a gimbal and you know you're gonna get really high quality imagery. And usually those are the biggest concerns that other people have when they're out shopping for a camera. I'm obviously not gonna go through every single thing that I like and dislike about the cameras, just the main things and some of the things that I think about right off the top. All right, so now that we covered all of those cameras, it's time to reveal to you which one is my favorite. And I think I'm gonna go with the Fuji X-H2, mainly because the image that I was getting out of that camera was so good, I wouldn't even be able to match it if I tried with any of my Sony cameras whether I did a ton of color grading or color correction or color matching, it just had a certain look to it and I can understand why Fuji has such a big fan base. I'm gonna be real with you. I highly considered returning the Sony FX30 
for the Fuji X-H2. I did make a comparison video between those two cameras, I just haven't released it yet, but it's gonna be coming out soon. The Fuji X-H2's image is just uncomparable to all of the rest. Thanks for watching this video. I'm Joe with the Film Alliance, and until the next one, have a nice year.